is Arca Media. Welcome to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. I'm your host, Mark Gunn. The views expressed on this program are those of the host and guests and not necessarily reflective of anyone or any entity associated with this broadcast. Welcome to Gunshot Straight from the Hip. My name is Mark Gunn. I am your host. And this episode, we are going to be talking about guns, safety, violence, and what it means for the African-American community to have possession of firearms. And with the mass murder that happened in Buffalo, where 10 African-Americans were killed, 13 injured by a white supremacist fearing replacement theory. There has been an increased call for African-Americans to arm themselves. Well, I have been on that call as well. However, the codicil that I've added is that it has to be done safely, and it has to be done with a lot of training. To that end, my guest, because I am in support of uh, African-American-owned gun dealers and training. Nobody can train us like us. Uh, I have the owner and one of the chief trainers of the Rhinox Research Group here in Louisville, Kentucky. Aaron McGahey, welcome aboard, man. Welcome. Hey, how are you, Mark? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right. All right, so um, in my search mm-hmm. for a uh, black firearms instructor, yes. I have a lot of people reach out. <laughs> and your name kept popping up over and over again. Really? Um, for a couple of reasons. A lot of people in the community know you. Mm-hmm. And they know of your qualifications. And we are situated right here in the west end of Louisville uh, in the old Walnut Street Community Center, uh, the old LCCC. So that's, you know, that's the first thing. You're right in the heart of the community. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people may not necessarily know that. So we'll get into that. But we want to get a little background on you. Yeah. I know that you are an Air Force veteran. I am. And how did being in the Air Force lead you to doing this and having this ownership? Um, so it happened quite naturally. Um, and I guess I'll give a little bit of context uh, of the significance of my position in the military. Mm-hmm. Uh, growing up, I was never allowed to have a gun, right. not even a water gun. You know, my mom was terrified that the police might, you know, see me playing with a toy gun mm-hmm. and then I would be shot. Trayvon Martin. And so, you know, I was never allowed to even touch guns. Mm -hmm. But then when I got to the military, they handed me a a rifle. And they were like, this is your gun. And I was like, this is mine? (laughs) And so I I just took to it. You know, I I was fascinated with, you know, this this tool, this, 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 this. There was a whole craft behind it, Mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, yes, I joined the United States Air Force as a security forces. Um, and that's like the military police. Right. And so within the military police, uh, after I did three tours. Mm-hmm. And so I did Kyrgyzstan, that's in between Russia and China. Right. Um, I did Afghanistan. I did counterinsurgency there. I was there for about a year. That's where I got the bulk of my combat experience. Oh, okay. Uh, we were attacked once a week, if not more. Wow. And we were in a joint combat outpost up in the mountains. And, uh, you know, that tool right there is what matured me a lot mm-hmm. in my my mindset, um, but then I, my final tour was Iraq. I was a part of Operation Inherent Resolve, which was a direct offensive against the ISIS fighters in mm-hmm. the city of Mosul. And so, but then when I got done with all that, I immediately uh, came back home. But after my first deployment to Kurdistan, when I got back home, they selected me to become a combat arms troop. Okay. And so, combat arms is our military weapons instructor. Mm-hmm. And so, I went from this person who grew up not touching guns right, right, right. to handed a rifle in basic training where I scored uh, marksman, expert marksman, by the way. Okay. And then I got home from my first deployment and they selected me to become a military weapons instructor. Wow. That is <laughs> quite, uh, quite the transition from not allowing them to be happy in right. home guns to, okay, I'm going to teach you how to so use them. So I'm training our entire air. Uh, uh, Air National Guard, you mm-hmm. know, I'm training everybody in our unit how to use their rifles, their pistols, their machine guns, everything. And, uh, you know, I'm essentially in charge of inventory of the guns. Right. If they break, it's my job to fix them. Mm-hmm. I gauge them, get them ready for inspection, for like the wing inspection. Uh, and then I was teaching the classes and, and help and running the gun range. Like, there was, uh, for about two years, you know, I was, I was doing tower operations, like 
the big voice on the range. And right, so, right. Yeah, like you said, I went from not being able to touch a gun to being in charge of everybody and what they do with guns. Wow. So basically, the level of training that you had just within the military itself mm -hmm. sounds like it surpassed that uh, of, I would say, an ordinary air. Absolutely, absolutely, because it was, I was what they call a SME, a SME. S -M -E, mm -hmm. and that's a subject matter expert. Oh, okay. So inside the unit, you know, whenever there was a question about small arms or weapon systems, I was asked the question, you know, I was put up to the task of solving those types of problems. Mm -hmm. um, but on the ground in tactical situations, it was also my responsibility to fix any gun that broke during operations and to also provide our commanders with on-ground uh, specifications on what our capabilities are, such as firepower. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot that it translated to from garrison to out of garrison. But the way that that leaked over into my civilian life when I got out mm -hmm. was I immediately started gaining my certifications with the United States Concealed Carry Association. Ah, okay, okay. And so now I, uh, you know, I hold multiple certifications with the USCCA, and I'm a training counselor with the USCCA. So I'm not just a firearms instructor; I actually make firearms instructors. See, I knew I came to the right guy for this. <laughs> And I've been seeing, I think ever since I put out the call for this, I've been seeing a lot of, of uh, ads for the USCCA. Yes. So, yep. uh, one of the things that I do want to get into, uh, because the laws everywhere are so different mm -hmm. as it relates to who can carry and, and how can you carry and this type of thing. But talk to me about the transition from the military mm -hmm. to the USCCA to owning your own uh, academy. So it was a transition for sure. And so, you know, I, I get out of the military. Um, I spent some time uh, working kind of like a corporate-ish job, climbing the corporate ladder, mm -hmm. and then the pandemic hits. Right. You know, and uh, while I was at that last job, I was saving up money to buy my first home. Oh, okay. And uh, I got about halfway there on the deposit, and then boom, pandemic hits. Right. Big kind of corporate uh, job, let's, just about everybody who's not senior management go, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking about like, what am I going to do? You know, am I just gonna sit here and burn up all my savings or am I going to actually like do something? You know, am I gonna sit here and wait for unemployment? I've never been a standby guy. Right, right, right. I don't like standing by. I don't like waiting. I gotta go and do something. And so I was like, I have skills. Mm -hmm. I have a ton of knowledge. All I need is the courage to treat my personal mission, which is something I've done all the time. I've always like told people what to do with guns, right. what not to do with guns, my friends, my family. You know, I've always hooked them up on the low with the training. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, why don't I just go for that? Because that's always been a dream of mine. This has always been a dream of mine. It's a personal passion to teach people this stuff mm -hmm. because I think it's so important. Oh, definitely. And so I decided to bet on myself. I took what was left of my savings for that home, mm -hmm. my first home, and I created Rhinox Research Group. Yeah, so, so the name Rhinox. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta ask you about that. So, uh, yeah, so the way I came up with the name Rhinox, uh, and I really hope that I don't get in trouble for this, but uh, it, first, I love Rhinox. Okay. If you if you know rhinos, right? Rhinos are, are very uh, naturally nice creatures. They're mm -hmm. not aggressive. You know, they're herbivores. They eat plants. Right. And so they usually just take care of their family, uh, but they are built for self defense. Makes sense. They have a very very thick skin mm -hmm. and a massive spear on their face. Right. 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 And right. they don't bother <laughs> people, but if you bother them or their family. Mm -hmm. They will steamroll you. Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm uh, beginning to see the correlation yes. between the rhino yeah. and, and what you're doing. Yeah, and, and I'm also a huge nerd. Okay. Uh, so Blurred Nation stand up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so being a huge nerd, I, I'm a huge fan of Transformers. Right. Okay. You see where I'm going? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, remember the spin-off series? Yeah. Beast Wars. Beast Wars, yeah. Back uh, when Optimus Primal, he's a gorilla. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> their weapons specialist was Rhinox. Rhinox. Okay. <laughs> and he was a rhino, 
And uh, he was this very nice, uh, very nice personality, very kind of like, uh, you know, oh, get out of here, little bunny. It's right, about to right, get right, dangerous. Right, right, right. But he had the most firepower. And he was like one of the most lethal, uh, what they call him, he was like the the, the, the good guy, right? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And so, but he was he was just that kind of guy, you know. He was nice. He always protected everybody. But he, when he came to it, he could put in some work. All right. We are talking with Aaron McGahey, the <laughs> owner and president of Rhinox Training Academy, uh, Rhinox Research Group. We've got more right after this. Station 104.7 WLOU. This year's Kentucky Derby and festival events generated an estimated $400 million in revenue. And as in years past, Louisville's black community was shut out of that economic windfall. This has been a long standing problem that falls on the shoulders of the Kentucky Derby Festival and its partners. It must be resolved. Lip service is unacceptable. The claim is that derby season is supposed to be about inclusion. However, we're not seeing it. And that is also unacceptable. To that end, we're giving you a chance to speak out and send a message directly to the Kentucky Derby Festival Board of Directors. If you're a business owner or just someone who demands change in the way Louisville's African-American community has been treated, speak your mind on the WLOU listener feedback line, 502-650-9325. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We'll take those messages directly to the Kentucky Derby Festival Board as a part of a demand to make major changes. Louisville's black community is a vital part of this city's economic engine, and the fact that we are constantly kicked to the curb when it comes to its prosperity is a slap in the face that we're simply no longer willing to tolerate. Call the WLOU listener feedback line. Once again, that number is 502-650-9325. We are the People Station, the original soul of Louisville. 104.7 WLOU. This is Mark This is Mark Gunn, and for more information about the multimedia services we offer, log on to our website at www.markgunmedia.com. That's markgunmedia.com. Mark Gunn Media, the high local class, just damn good work. Welcome back to Gunshot Straight from the Hip. I am Mark Gunn. We are kicking it at the Rhinox Research Group with Aaron McGahey, who is the head firearms instructor here. The reason for this episode is because there is an increased call for African Americans to own and train with firearms. And I wanted to talk with an expert, and if you were with us the last segment, we indeed have an expert. So we were talking about your transition from the military to the uh, the beginnings of the Rhinox Research Group. Yes. So you've been around for a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. And I think what, as we talked beforehand, one of the issues that we were having and this is an issue that I think affects a lot of, of, of African Americans is that the training is there, but we don't know. You're kind of hiding in plain sight. Yeah, so one of the, the biggest challenges with uh, what I'm doing is how do we have this conversation mm-hmm. with the community that is rife psychologically with misinformation mm-hmm. with religious dogma right with a uh, moral quandary and dilemma about violence and with the constant pressure of passivity to that end uh if you are here in louisville kentucky uh there used to be several gun buyback programs that were always aimed at the black community, but nowhere else. So that lends yeah. to, to part of that. So we have always been dissuaded from yes. gun ownership, uh, whether it be because of the violence within the black community, mm-hmm. uh, that old racist black on black crime trope, mm-hmm. um, the religious and moral dogma, yeah. and the belief that the Second Amendment does not apply to us. And that is probably the biggest issue, and I'm glad you said that. Uh, that's the biggest issue that I've seen whenever I teach my concealed carry classes, Mm -hmm. whenever I teach and I I talk about so much in those classes. It's not just about guns. It's also about conflict avoidance. It's about the Second Amendment. It's about the Fourth Amendment. It's about the Fifth Amendment. And it's literally giving you the education you need to understand this. The Constitution applies to black, uh, black Americans 
It applies to the entire black community. Mm -hmm. It applies to everyone who is a citizen of this country. And the problem is we have not opted in wholesale to participate in that part of America. And what my job is, is I like to clear the air. I don't miss my words when I have these conversations in the classroom about castle doctrine, right. about stand your ground law, about the not having a duty to retreat in Kentucky, uh, about the Second Amendment and how we all have the right to bear arms. And if you're not familiar with the Castle Doctrine, basically it is your right to defend your home or your property. In Kentucky, the Castle Doctrine also extends to automobiles. There was a case a few years ago where uh, a former, I believe it was a UFL basketball player, was assaulted and somebody reached in his car in order to try to hurt him and that person that reached in ended up getting shot. Mm -hmm. And the controversy was, well, did he have a right to defend himself in his car? And it turns out that he does. So the fact that we haven't bought in wholesale right. to the Second Amendment, and why is it that we were talking about this before we started? There seems to be this, and I, I got a little bit of a, a bunch of pushback mm -hmm. uh, because I've been an advocate for the last few weeks of people arming themselves. Yeah. Why Welcome to the party? Yeah. Why? why <laughs> Is it, do you think, that there's, you get pushback from segments of the white community whenever we talk about arming ourselves? Well, there's, a, there's this kind of latent expectation for low-grade performance mm -hmm. from the black community. Now, this is not real. This is a perception that is held by people who already don't like us. Right for whatever reason they made that decision. And when you start talking about guns, mm -hmm. and we talk about how we don't always get the benefit of the doubt of how we will perform in you know, more sophisticated environments, right. all some of these folks can see is an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. That's all they can see is a bunch of people negligently discharging firearms inside of a building and hurting themselves and being a danger to other people around them. I'll have people know that I control the entire training environment in which uh, we uh, train with our guns, with the alumni club. Mm -hmm. we, sometimes we have, you know, plus 30 people out there shooting guns. And we have had zero, zero safety incidents zero negligent discharges, zero injuries. And I'm telling you, nobody's tripped and failed, mm -hmm. nobody's fainted, nobody's had to be put on a litter, nobody's received a split, nobody's been hurt during any of my training. So there's one more misconception that you can throw out the window. And then the fact that, uh, you know, one of the big issues that happens is the negligence that you speak of. Mm -hmm. 90% of stolen firearms are stolen out of people's cars. Uh, you've got people that don't secure their weapons to the point to where children get a hold of them and disaster strikes. Yes. I was actually brought, uh, I was contacted by Spectrum News One mm -hmm. and they wanted my opinion and uh, I was in, I guess I, someone else was on the, from the Louisville Metro Police Department was also on the story and we were both covering the story. Mm -hmm. um, and they were looking at it from their angle and I was looking at it from my angle. And we were both saying the same thing. Right. You know, the police department, they had more details, um, but I knew it from a training standard. Like storage, proper storage mm -hmm. is a part of responsible gun ownership. That is a fundamental skill that you learn in my concealed carry class. I teach this. You know, it's something you have to know in order to consider yourself a responsible gun owner. And so, putting your, leaving your gun in the car is a guaranteed way for it to be used for robbery, mm -hmm. or murder, or kidnapping. It, you're just giving guns away to criminals. That is how guns go to the street. Right. I would say well over 60% of all guns that are used in crime and out there, what we call on the street, mm -hmm. were stolen out of somebody's vehicle. Stop leaving, stop leaving your guns in your car.
take them in the house and put them in a safe because they are going directly into the hands of criminals. They're going directly into the hands of people who are going to use them for no good, right? And so I did that. And then the police, what they showed mm -hmm. is they could show the details on how gun, guns are reported stolen, right? criminals are arrested, right? and they found the gun. There you go. We're going to stop here for a second, and there's some technology I want to ask you about okay. that, is, that is on the horizon, and it's something that I'm looking for. We've got more gunshots straight from the hip right after this. This is our gun media. Hit it! One of the biggest accomplishments we've had over the past year is the continued growth of our podcast, Gunshots Straight from the Hip. If you haven't heard it, you can check it out now on our website at markgunmedia.com or on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the TuneIn Radio app. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Past episodes are available for download right now. Each episode is written and produced from a perspective not heard enough in this medium the black perspective. However, gunshot straight from the hip is not limited to a black audience. Anyone can get something out of it. We tackle social and political issues, sometimes some slice of life stuff, in a way that's very compelling and unlike any other podcast on the market right now. With my experience as an award-winning audio producer and a reputation for being rather outspoken, gunshots straight from the hip is something you won't want to miss. Over the next year, we want to add more subscribers with a goal of 1,000 new subscribers every month. If you haven't joined us yet, go to our website, markgunmedia.com, and hit the podcast link. You could also subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you're already with us, thank you. We just ask that you turn your friends and family on to us. Remember, we have a goal of 1,000 new subscribers every month, and we can't do it without your support. That's Gunshots Straight from the Hip, available right now at markgunmedia.com, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the Tuned In Radio app. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hoopla, just damn good work. Welcome back to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. My name is Mark Gunn, and I am here with Aaron McGahee, who is the owner and president of the Rhinox Research Group a firearms academy here in the heart of West Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, so we were talking about the basics of um, gun ownership and some of the liabilities that people take, uh, stolen firearms and that type of thing. But one of, the, one of the pieces of technology that I'm most excited about, this is something that I have been advocating for years, are bioengineered weapons. There is a company out of, I believe they're out of Texas, that is developing a firearm that can only be fired by its registered owner. Mm -hmm. And the ownership is pretty much, they're taking the idea from cell phone technology, how you, you know, you're know you able to get into your phone with a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And they are using a hybrid of that technology to develop the firearms. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the initial release is supposed to be a little bit later on this year. Okay. And I've heard a lot of pushback mm -hmm. on these types of weapons because of limited access. Yeah. Would that be something that you would encourage as a firearms instructor? No, no, I would not. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, and it's, so when you talk about, and I get where this, how these ideas come about. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want a Judge Tread gun? You know, who right. wouldn't want a gun that can switch Voice activated Siri Alexa gun mm -hmm. that you can do, like switch over to hollow points and it switches or like even having a gun that that looks that cool. Right. But when you talk about uh, being pragmatic, okay, when you talk about an actual gun battle, and I I, did, I was talking about this the other day mm -hmm. with some students, um, we tend to do a poor job of truly understanding what an emergency situation looks like that demands a gun be involved. Right. You know, like I get into this whole conversation with people that own revolvers about how the longer the battle rages on, the more useless a revolver becomes. That's why no military unit uses them. 
That's why no police department issues a revolver. Mm -hmm. it's, it's obsolete, it's old tech, right? So now we're talking about new technology and we have to decide how do we go with this, right? So if you're looking at maybe home defense, right? Let's yeah. just use home defense. Sure. You're at home, you have your biometric pistol mm -hmm. that only you can shoot. What happens when you go down? Good point. Can, can, can your partner, partner not weapon? pick up that weapon and use it? You right, know, right. Is it going to be registered to your partner? Or are you going to register it to your children? Mm -hmm. You know, it just becomes, like you said, a restriction more than in a, in enabling, right? Okay. So, like, um, and, and that conversation shifts a lot to training itself, right? A lot of people will say, well, you know, if you're demanding people to get training, then you're restricting their access to firearms because they have to come and train. I'm like, the, training is not a restriction. It's enabling. Just like when you go do your driver's test, yeah. that is not restricting you from driving. It actually enables you to drive safely on the roads. Training, gun training, enables you to use guns. Mm -hmm. So it is something that you you should want to do right. so that you can be that responsible gun owner. And you can do it with the latest and the greatest information out there in the world. Talk to the people that live in Switzerland because they are required by law to own firearms. However, that firearm ownership also comes with training that the, that the state sponsors and provides. So there is, there is a great upside to being you know, to being weapons trained. And one of the things that I've also just heard from other instructors, it's not only important to get training with handguns, every person should be trained with a handgun and some sort of rifle. Handgun, rifle, shotgun. Okay. That's the holy trinity of personal defense. So the handgun is a personal, so a lot of people don't understand like how these weapons are tiered, right? Okay. What their role is. And so I'll break it down for you. A handgun is a secondary personal defense system. Okay. It is like a life raft or a, a life jacket. If you're thrown overboard into the ocean, mm -hmm. it's your life jacket. It'll just keep you above water. Okay. Right? That's what a handgun is. A, a shotgun is a high volume, short distance weapon system. So it's like shooting eight bullets at the same time. Mm -hmm but it's also designed for CQC, close quarter combat, right. so it's great for home defense. Mm -hmm. A rifle is designed for offense. That is a primary weapon system designed for offense. It is how you take the fight to them, right? And I, I had a friend ask me, you know, I'm thinking about, do I get a, a, a rifle for home defense or do I get a shotgun for home defense? Mm -hmm. And I say, it depends on how many of it is right. and where they at. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> now the other drawback to that, and, and this is again, you'll notice that everything that we talk about will always dovetail back to training of some sort. Yes. I hear, and this is misinformation, that you know, with a rifle and or a shotgun, uh, one of the advantage the advantages mm -hmm. is that you don't have to be as accurate. Yeah, that's not true. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's because not true. One of the things that you learn when you take a concealed carry class mm -hmm. is that there is a legal liability that you face. Mm -hmm. If you should happen to get into a firefight and other people get hurt or other property gets damaged, there is you could you could kill somebody in self defense and still be brought up on charges for negligence. And that's something that people have to realize as well. Absolutely, and that's that's why I partner with the USCCA. That's mm -hmm. why I've got my certifications with, with the United States Concealed Carry Association. Rhinox Research Group stands as an official partner with the United States Concealed Carry Association. Mm -hmm. And I'm using that partnership to interject their, uh, their liability insurance and to interject their protective programs uh, in their educational programs into the black community. And, you know, I know there might be somebody who say, well, why do you think it's so important that the black community has access to the USCCA? Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the likelihood of experiencing gun violence, when you talk about the likelihood of needing 
to use the gun in self-defense. The USCCA provides well over $2 million in resources to protect uh, members mm -hmm. in case of justified self-defense. So they take care of everything after you pull the trigger. Right. They're going to buy you a defense attorney that's been active in the courtroom for over five years, specifically doing self-defense cases, mm -hmm. right? So you're getting a qualified defense attorney, powerful representation in the court of law. You're also getting all of your criminal and civil trial fees paid. Oh, cool. You don't have to pay to defend yourself. Right. And then they're bailing you out of jail so you don't spend a night in jail. And even if the police take your gun for evidence, they will buy you a replacement gun. So there you go. There you go. Knowledge is power, I'm telling you. Speaking of knowledge, let's talk about a day in class here at Rhinox, a research group. Mm -hmm. So take me from enrollment through, because the way that you're set up, and, and we'll get a shot of this, yeah. is that you do have a classroom setting in this particular facility, but your firing range, mm -hmm. well, you got two of them that, that, that we'll allude to in a second. Your practical exercise firing range yeah. is off-site. Yes. But you do have a firing range within this center. Yes, I do, yeah. Okay, so take me through the time I'm, I'm a new student, okay. I'm walking in the door. Take me through that exercise. Okay, you want to start at the door or at the website? Uh, let's start at the website. Okay. okay, okay. So, believe it or not, most people find out about my nice research group through my social media posts. Okay. <laughs> I just, I, I'm on there a lot, and uh, you know, that's how I connect a lot with people. And so what they'll do is they'll go to the website, and they'll see the website, and immediately they'll learn a little bit about us, and then they'll see our training calendar. Um, and then they'll look on the dates and see where, which class they want and if it's available on the day they want it. And even if it's not, they can always send us an email and request a class date. Right. And then we will work with them to see if we can actually set that up. And so uh, click that and then they'll register. And then once they register, uh, they get an email notification letting them know, you know, here's your ticket to the class um, and, and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they show up on a training date and as you see, we do have a full, uh, full spectrum uh, classroom, AV, all kinds of stuff. And so they'll come in, they'll sign their liability waiver. Mm -hmm. I usually have some music playing. Uh, <laughs> I, we have free snacks. Right, we right, have right. all kinds of snacks here. We got soda, we got chips, granola bar, and coffee, uh, and water, and all that good stuff. Um, so well, they're enjoying the snack, filling out their liability waiver. We're playing good music for them. Mm -hmm. so they can, relax and settle in. Right. I always tell people get comfortable. You ain't going nowhere. Right. right. <laughs> Not for a while. Not for a while. And so uh, average training day is about four hours. Oh, okay. Uh, except for concealed carry, that's six hours. Right, right. I like to do everything in one day. Okay, because it used to be eight hours, if memory serves. So the standard here is uh, six hours, mm -hmm. one hour on the gun range. Oh, okay. Makes sense. So we spend about six hours classroom time, one hour on the gun range. Okay. Um, for the qualification. But yeah, they'll fill out the liability waiver and then I'll do my introduction. Mm -hmm. um, and then after my introduction, we, we roll into the training, right? Um, and so during the training, we're going to learn things like uh, legal use of force, conflict avoidance, uh, self defense firearm basics, self uh, shooting, defensive shooting fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, we learn uh, gear and gadgets. We talk about holsters and right. things like that. We get really into the weeds on a lot of stuff. But one of the coolest things people don't realize that I, I teach and I talk about is violent encounters themselves. Oh, how, right. how we as human beings respond to violence. Right. Also the aftermath. You know, how to engage with somebody, but what do you do when the police show up? A lot of people don't know, but I teach people how to deal with the police. Mm -hmm. What to say to the police, what not to say to the police. How to let them know that you don't consent to a search of yourself or your property. Right. That you will not talk until you get a lawyer. Right. You know, all that good stuff. What to say on the police call. Um, and then morality and ethics, you know, keeping your spirits up during the due process system. But they will we'll do all that in class and mm -hmm. then uh, we start going hands on. Okay. So it's a lot of brain stuff before lunch. And then uh, after lunch, we go hands on with the handgun. Right. Okay. So it's a lot of education, but then we do a lot of practical stuff. And so we'll start with the rubber guns. 
and then we have these rubber, well, I call them rubber duckies. Right, right. And so right, they're right. these rubber molded tra training guns and we learn how to hold the gun. Mm -hmm. And then once we're comfortable with that, we move over to our laser training. We're gonna pick it up right here. We're gonna stop right here, take a little bit of break, and then we will actually show you the laser training and uh, everything else related to training here at the Rhinox uh, Research Group. It's Gunshots Straight the Hip. We'll be right back. This is Mark Gun Media. Hit it! Hey, what's up? This is Mark Gunn. I have an audio book that I collaborated on with author Steve Dustcircle. It's called Before Your First Gig. It's written specifically for the new band or artist just getting started. In about 15 minutes, we will give you the blueprint for setting up to give live performances, marketing your band, and making your music presentable to the masses and the audience that you're going after. Thousands of dollars in sound advice for, get this, $3.99. That's right, $3.99. To download Download your copy. Simply go to my website, markgunmedia.com. That's markgunmedia.com, and the link is on the home page. It's available from Audible, iTunes, and Amazon. Just click the link that you prefer. As an added bonus, with the proof of purchase, I'll send you the Mark Gun Media Artist Starter Kit at no additional cost. In it, you'll find all the resources you need to learn about music licensing and publishing, how to register your music with BDS and SoundScan in order to get radio airplay. There's also information about how to become a member of ASCAP and BMI. All the forms you need are included. And finally, the relationship between music and money, how you can cash in. Once you've downloaded your copy of Before Your First Gig, send me an email confirmation by going once again to the website markgunmedia.com and hit the contact us link. Just give me the name of one of the chapters you heard and any feedback about the book that you may have. And I will send you that artist starter kit. Thousands of dollars worth of information for just under $4. You won't find this anywhere else. Remember, go to markgunmedia.com and download Before Your First Gig from the link on the homepage. Reach out with your proof of purchase by giving me the name of one of the chapters you heard. And the Mark Gun Media Artist Starter Kit is yours at no additional cost. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hoopla. Just damn good work. Welcome back to Gunshot Straight from the Hip. It is uh, Mark Gunn, and we are here at the Rhinox Research Group with uh, Aaron McGahee, who was the owner and operator, one of the very few African-American firearms instructors here in Louisville. And we were talking about classroom training. Yes. And I did allude to the fact that you have two, you've got an off-site firing range and you've got an on-site firing range. Yes. And talk to me about the, the on-site firing range. So what we have inside of our academy is a laser training system. We use the laser light training system and this laser gun is modeled after a Glock 19. And so it has the same weight and trigger pull as a Glock 19. And what this does is it allows our students to practice their shooting fundamentals before they move on to live fire qualification. So this system here, uh, each gun it has a board, a receiving board, and that board will record the shots from this gun. And so what I'll try to do is I'll try to put three on the bullseye for you. Okay. And so, essentially, it has functional iron sights. They're going to use those iron sights to nail the target. Okay, so yeah, you hit dead center on. You hit dead center there we the go. first time, and then yeah. and then there's a one right, right there. Okay. And so then we clear it out, mm -hmm. and that's one mode. And then we have another mode for our basic handgun two class. And that's where we pick up the speed a little bit. And so the second mode is a time drill that we use for our students to put a little bit of pressure on their fundamental skills right. so they can see where they need to improve. Everybody can improve. And so in this setting, what we do is we start a timer. And the timer, it's a point shoot. So as soon as I fire a shot, it's mm -hmm. going to stop the timer and it's going to capture the shot. So we start the timer. Okay. And then we come up and we take our shot. And so the goal for this is to hit the bullseye under three seconds. Oh, okay. So the you do you find that the the typical response time of a novice and then somebody that gets a little more advanced with the training 
tends to increase or does it level off or does it stay the same? So the re response time actually decreases, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. The shorter the window, the faster you can draw, put around on target before that individual can react. Um, a lot, when we talk about the three second drill, right? Right. We're talking about tracking movement. If you can fire that round in under three seconds and hit a small target such as a bullseye or eight inch circle, that means that you can put a round on a human being before they can track your hand movement. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And with the, the, with the laser training, yes. uh, it kind of moves you into the, uh, going back to the blurred thing, kind of moves you oh, into the yeah, video exactly, game space, absolutely. right? Absolutely, it, it definitely, once you get into it, there is a bit of game to it, but it's practical, like this is, stuff that you can translate over to real life. It mm -hmm. can actually save your life. Being able to, you know, use functional iron sights. You know, I know a lot of people are using red dots and stuff, but that doesn't help you with trigger pull. That doesn't right. help you with proper grip. That doesn't help you with anticipation of recoil. So it's, it's always going to be important to get some type of dry fire training, some type of uh, realistic trigger pulling going on. So on average, from start to finish, uh, what are the durations of your of your classes from the time somebody comes in to the time they're ready to get their CCW? So um, are you talking about how long does the concealed carry class take? Right. Uh, so a total of about seven hours. So they'll come in, um, we'll sign the waivers, we'll start the training. Midway through the training, we'll do a lunch break. Uh, sometimes we have a guest speaker come in from the USCCA to talk to them about the USCCA mm -hmm. and uh, help them uh, get enrolled if they wish to. And then we do the second half of training, which is hands-on with the firearms, and then we do our laser training. And then after the laser training, that's when we head over to the gun range. Um, and that's where we do the live fire qualification. And then after that, we dismiss them from the range with their certificate. And if memory serves, as it's been a minute since <laughs> since I qualified for my uh, my permit, I think you had to hit something like 11 out of 20 in order to qualify. Correct. So you get 20 rounds. Um, the target is a man-sized target. It is at 21 feet, and you have to hit 11 out of the 20 rounds on the uh, silhouetted target. All right. So uh, speaking of which, so we have to kill this misnomer. Uh, because we, you were talking earlier before we got started about the, the Hollywood effect yeah. when it comes to, uh, to people in firearms. Uh, you hear people say all the time, well, why couldn't you just shoot them in the leg or shoot them in Nobody the arm? Nobody's training to shoot anybody in the legs or arms or head. That's, right. As we go big target, right? That's the, uh, what we call the cardiovascular triangle. Mm -hmm. um, high center. That's the largest target um, with the least amount of movement. So that's where we aim to impact, and then you want to do that in volume. So basically, you're firing center mass, mm -hmm. and you don't stop firing until the threat is neutralized. The threat. Neutralized, Absolutely. right? Yes. Right. And so one of the trick bags that you get into there, um, and this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and and I think you can speak to this is the. Um, the whole charge of excessive force. I've seen gun owners defending the property mm -hmm. and um, end up getting charged with such a degree. But I also think that with gun laws becoming a little less restrictive, you're not gonna see so many of those charges anymore. Well, a lot of those charges are due to ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, there are, limiting factors on how much force can be used, even in a deadly situation. Um, so there are times in which the fight has to be considered over with. Right. So uh, if, if the attacker is fleeing, if they decided they no longer want to fight and they just want to run away, you have to let them run away. Right. So if you just start shooting at them and they end up perishing because you're shooting at them as they're running away, then yes, you can face an excessive uh, force charge, uh, even you know manslaughter. Uh, if the attacker is wounded, 
and it's clear that they don't want to continue the fight, you cannot then, you know, execute that person. Right. That is excessive force as well. And then lastly, a lot of prosecutors are going to look at, did you have the opportunity to retreat? Mm. Could you have left the situation entirely safely and not been pushed to the point of taking a life? Now, we do have some protection here in Kentucky. Right. In Kentucky, there is no duty to retreat underneath uh, standard ground law. And so what that means is if anybody brings deadly force to you, then you can stand your ground and then defend yourself. You don't have to run away um, here in Kentucky. All right, we're going to wrap up in just a second. More on Gunshot Straight from the Hip right after this. Station 104.7 WLOU. This year's Kentucky Derby and festival events generated an estimated $400 million in revenue. And as in years past, Louisville's black community was shut out of that economic windfall. This has been a long standing problem that falls on the shoulders of the Kentucky Derby Festival and its partners. It must be resolved. Lip service is unacceptable. The claim is that derby season is supposed to be about inclusion. However, we're not seeing it. And that is also unacceptable. To that end, we're giving you a chance to speak out and send a message directly to the Kentucky Derby Festival Board of Directors. If you're a business owner or just someone who demands change in the way Louisville's African-American community has been treated, speak your mind on the WLOU listener feedback line, 502-650-9325. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We'll take those messages directly to the Kentucky Derby Festival Board as a part of a demand to make major changes. Louisville's black community is a vital part of this city's economic engine, and the fact that we are constantly kicked to the curb when it comes to its prosperity is a slap in the face that we're simply no longer willing to tolerate. Call the WLOU listener feedback line. Once again, that number is 502-650-9325. We are the People Station, the original soul of Louisville. 104.7 WLOU. Welcome back to Gunshot Street from the Hip. My name is Mark Gunn, and we have been kicking it here at the Rhinox Research Group with owner and chief fire and our firearms instructor, Aaron McGahee. I have a lot of information that we were able to get to this episode. And if people wanted to learn more about the organization and what it is that you do, and more importantly, if you want to enroll in classes, how can they get hold of them? So, very simple. You just visit rhinoxresearchgroup.com. Um, check out our training calendar. We have an about me section. You can learn about who we are, what we stand for, what we're trying to do. Um, you can also see what we've done in the past, mm -hmm. you know, some of those news articles. But you just click on where it says, you know, training courses. You'll see a calendar and you'll see a bunch of courses in that calendar. Find a date that works good for you. Find a class that you're interested in and then go ahead and tap that, and it's gonna open up the course detail page, mm -hmm. and that is where you can go ahead and register for that course. And you know, this type of training is not all that expensive, uh, and it's well worth every penny that you spend to not only be able to defend yourself, but to defend your family as well. Uh, what's the youngest that you'll actually take at the, uh, at the research group? as far as training? So for public classes, we do 12 and up, mm -hmm. um, and they have to be accompanied by a legal guardian. Um, but for a private class, I'll teach anybody's child. Mm -hmm. If you feel like your child is capable and is mature enough for that responsibility, I will, I will help assist in that because if we can get them younger, mm -hmm. I believe that will safeguard us from a lot of future uh, stigma, a lot of future uh, dogma, and a lot of future misconceptions about guns because they've been taught at such an early age. Right. Uh, I was recently uh, brought on WDRB to talk about self-inflicted gunshot wounds yes. on the rise in Louisville, Kentucky. It turned out all of those victims were Afri African American males mm -hmm. that were teenagers. Mm. They were teenagers. Their kids getting a hold of their parents' guns, getting a hold of their friends' parents' guns, mm -hmm. and just handling it. Jeez. And you know, they either end up shooting themselves or they end up yeah, shooting their best friend. Right. But that's a life we lose. So we all need to be trained. And something that I've said before and I continue to say ignorance is not a form of defense. No. Mm -mm. And it's not how you protect kids. 
You cannot protect kids by not teaching them. They need to know so that when they're out of your supervision, mm -hmm. they can make good decisions. But they cannot make good decisions. They cannot make intelligent decisions if they don't know how. All right, and on that note, this has been Gunshot Straight from the Hip. For all past episodes, just go to my website at markgunmedia.com or anywhere that you get your podcast. Aaron, thank you so much for doing this, man. This is so timely and so important uh, with everything going on uh, inside and outside of the African-American community. So we will see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. You've been listening to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. The views expressed are those of the host and guests and not reflective of any business entity or anyone associated with this broadcast. If you have any comments or want more information on how to be a sponsor, log on to our website at markgunmedia.com or call us at 502-407-0283. That's 502-407-0283. Thank you for listening. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hope.